Innovation and entrepreneurship are among core pillars of Georgia Tech's College of Engineering. And for many engineers, that means becoming an entrepreneur after earning their degree. I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering, and this is The Uncommon Engineer. Our guests today are brothers, often known as the Tech Twins, Travis and Troy Nunnally. They both earned graduate degrees from the College of Engineering. They became serial entrepreneurs and co-founded a business venture called Brain Rain Solutions. They're here today to talk about their experience as both engineers and entrepreneurs. Welcome to the program, Travis and Troy. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. It is a pleasure. I can't wait to talk about a, a whole bunch of different things, but you know, we're recording the um, this podcast right in the midst of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, so many things have changed, and if it's okay, that's really where I'd like to start. If you could okay. both talk a little bit about about your startup. Brain Rain Solutions, and I'm really curious about how it's affected you, your business, how you might have pivoted, and also um, what your clients are seeing. Okay, so Brain Rain Solutions is a software development and product launch firm. Um, so we focus on bringing products to life, um, and it's typically in the realm of artificial intelligence, um, augmented reality, and usually complex technologies. Um, so when COVID hit, uh, we saw a very interesting dynamic of our business. Um, so with, with COVID, usually the businesses that were impacted the most were, most were your gathering institutions, that's what we call them. Um, those are companies like restaurants, um, those are spaces, clubs, places where people gather in groups of people. For us, all of those companies started moving to an online or digital presence, uh, meaning that they started thinking through a strategy in a, way, in, in a way to reach their customers in a very unique but digital platforms. For us, that's a gold mine uh, because we specialize in digital strategy and product development from a app, mobile apps and web app standpoint. Um, so we actually saw an uptick in business. Uh, which is very uh, not, not heard of in, in this space of the COVID. Um, most of our companies started coming to us asking for, uh, most of our clients started coming to us asking for communication tools, um, live video streaming, text message campaigns, um, things that they can communicate better with their constituents and their, their customers so that they can be, uh, you know, increase their business and stay alive and survive through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we saw a very interesting dynamic. We're excited because of it. Um, it actually opened up opportunities. Um, I think it was Winston Churchill that said, in every crisis is a great opportunity. <laughs> and we saw that great opportunity and realized it and took advantage of it. And we're hoping that the people who are struggling and, and may need assistance, um, that they realize that, hey, this is a way that we can do business differently and realize it's a, more of an opportunity rather than um, a challenge. Yeah, COVID-19 is a new normal, as they said. And when you have a new normal, you have to do things differently. And what we try to do is try to get people to say, hey, this is opportunity for you to be more online, more on social media, more doing live content so that your business can scale globally. Because when you locally, if you're a local business, then is not necessarily uh, it's local, but when you're online, it's a global presence. So this is an opportunity for us. Sometimes in, in, other, in some cases, it's, it's not an opportunity because of the uh, unemployment, but in the terms of digital and technology, it's an opportunity for a lot of businesses. You touched on a, a, a bunch of different type of companies. Was there a typical company that came, and maybe you could give, a, give an example, say in the, in the food service or restaurant, kind of business, someone who you never worked for, it'd be, I, I'm really curious about what that, what that looks like. They come to us, they came to you probably saying, oh my word, <laughs> yeah. you know, everything changed, help me. And um, I'm really curious, like saying about how that all, how that unfolds and what their needs were, and then how your company meets those needs. 
Yeah, so for us, um, we focus, our demographic that we focus on are actually companies um, that are the tool makers. Um, so they usually have some software or presence. Um, so for example, um, we have a equity in a company that does dermatology um, tools. And it, it basically assesses the skin. Uh, we use image processing to look at lesions on the skin, whether it's pimples or whether it's freckles. And we recommend products to give you a better quality skin experience. Um, so dermatologist offices is a brick and mortar business. They get patients to come in. They uh, you know assess that patient. They're sitting in a waiting room uh, where you can pass COVID-19. We decided to take a online presence approach and build a tool that allowed them to do online assessments. Um, so what that looks like is a, a patient will now use their QR code or a link, click, go to a page that they ask, get asked a series of questions as well as take images of their face. And then a, a sales consultant, a skincare consultant will call that patient and uh, do a skincare analysis as long as, as that supports our recommendations from the algorithm. So they essentially call the patient and say, hey, I noticed that you have oily skin um, according to the algorithm. Um, we want to recommend this uh, you know, moisturizer that is better for oily skin. Um, and that allowed the customers uh, in this case, one of our dermatologists, our office actually saw not a decrease in sales, but the sales actually maintained level. It didn't increase, but in the pandemic, staying level is 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 is, is crucial. Um, so they actually made you know three thousand, four thousand, five thousand days, um, you know five thousand dollar days um, with uh, with with our with our sales tool and our, our tool for for that for that uh, and, customer. And and so, the, and that's a customer that you had no interaction with before. That's a that's a brand that's a brand new customer for you. Uh, yeah. So we we onboarded that customer during the pandemic. Yes. So that's a brand new customer that had no interaction. I mean, they had a little bit of interaction, um, but it wasn't. You know, when I mean a little bit, that means they they were on the fence with using us. We was in there was in our sales funnel. Um, we was trying to close that deal, but the pandemic gave us the opportunity to close it faster because there became a real need to, to have these type of tools. And, and um, that sounds like that's a, that's a real success. I, and, I'm, and as you, you pointed out that there are so many uh, folks that have lost their jobs and so many difficult stories to tell. Um, I'm curious if, uh, if there's a, a, a not so rosy story to tell about customers that you've seen and how COVID-19 has affected them, and even despite your best efforts, can't help because of the the, the situation. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, so there's a customer. Um, there's customers that did hiring freezes. <laughs> um, so in opportunity, there's two choices. I mean, in in a, in, a, in a, a challenge like this, like a pandemic or a recession. There's two te uh, two choices you can make as a company. Um, you can retract, and you can start firing, laying off people, cut the bottom line, cut the bottom line, um, closing up doors, and start being a a hoarder of your your resources. So start collecting cash and make sure that your company doesn't die in this pandemic. But then there's a group of companies that start to work harder. They start to make more calls and expand during the pandemic. They know that there's a series of companies that's going to not use their marketing budget, for example. So that gives me an opportunity to go in and, and take that customer. Um, so we've seen companies that retract it. And the way that looks like for us is that they'll do a high, they'll do a hiring freeze. Uh, we may, you know, they'll say, you know, we're on it as a contract. Uh, we're, we're helping them build their software, but they'll say, hey, we're going to freeze this project. Um, and, and from in those cases, we don't know if that's the best decision with freezing technology when technology is your solution to overcoming the pandemic. Um, so those those customers, you know, we, we encourage to think as an expansion mindset, um, even in these in these you know tough and challenging times. Yeah, and in, in that company, they cut the operations. So the operations team was cut by fifty percent. Um, they was more uh, in those operations was like cold calling. 
kind of support costs, support support team. costs, or support teams. Um, and this company specifically was a insurance, their insurance company. So they had to cut their uh, their support cost down. But the technology team uh, stayed level. They didn't, like you said, they just uh, they just froze hiring. They didn't, let, they didn't they didn't let anybody off, but they just stopped the hiring uh, moving forward. So um, in that case, it was a, a traumatic experience because I had to ask uh, the guy, our, our client, hey, what's going to happen to us? Um, what's going to happen to the people that we put onto your team? Are they staying? Because you, uh, we see that you're cutting your operations or are they leaving? And that was a, a tough conversation with the client. Luckily, he said, hey, you okay? Um, your team is okay. But I can imagine uh, when... Is not so good for other people who have clients, other companies, other entrepreneurs that uh, need revenue and they're being cut from projects. And I know Troy, uh, I'm an electrical engineer, uh, a PhD in double E, and so I'm really curious about your perspective on technology from the standpoint of, you know, what what have you seen just even in the last two or three months, either tools of the trade or or where you see tech, you know, as technology might have replaced those folks and those jobs might not come back, what do you see in terms of trends around technology? What are the things that you're using? What are, what are the new pieces that are being developed that, that say maybe are benefiting from, from COVID? Uh, so the technology is that we are seeing is artificial intelligence, so there's been a, a big boom, a big trend on the growth of artificial intelligence in essentially across the industry. Um, and that is going to help reduce down cost because they, the, the rule of thumb behind artificial intelligence is if you can do it for one second and you can think about the task for one second, it probably can be automated. So for example, mm -hmm. if I were to make a phone call, you know, and it only takes me you know, five seconds to, to dial the number that can be automated. Uh, if I can, uh, you know, type type a, a particular sentence to send an email out to another person, that can be automated. So those are the things that uh, AI is doing is to make people's lives more productive. But it, it's at a cost of people who may not be so technical, who doing those tasks manually, they may uh, be displaced. So it's up to us as engineers and, and, and entrepreneurs and uh, academia to be able to find solutions to either uh, help offset those uh, displaced jobs, either retool an employee or find other ways to make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, making a good income. And another technology that's really big is the Internet of Things. So everybody's talking about home automation, automating uh, different things in your car and uh, in your office. And that is a really big and booming thing, especially in the electrical engineering field. Uh, it's really big and booming because everything can be put. You can hook an electronic market processor up to pretty much a coffee mug, anything, and mm -hmm. it can be automated. So I think that is up and going in, 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 in training. Like, so those are two big ones that I see. So I'd be really curious to hear more just about, you know, what, how, how your company developed and how many employees you have now. Um, and I know that in one of the things that I've seen is that one of your aspirations either personally or as part of your, of your company is to touch 10,000 companies or to assist them in their development. And so maybe that's a, a philosophy or a corporate culture. I'm really curious to learn more about your company and, uh, and, and some of those other things. Okay. Yeah. So um, we started in 2009. Um, the company actually originated from a project at Georgia Tech. Um, we were part of the organization at Georgia Tech that was launching and hosting a symposium, which is essentially a all of Georgia Tech graduate students showcase their work. Um, at that point, they needed a way to house the abstracts of the and show um, these abstracts to 
sponsors and visitors. Like for example, if Microsoft is coming to the symposium, they want to see basically a portfolio of all the abstracts in, in the um, uh, at the at the symposium. So at that point, we saw a need, uh, which is always what our company is focused on: finding a need first, and then we build a solution. We never build solutions unless the need is expressly uh, expressed. Um, and, 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 and it's uh, backed up by customers who's willing to pay it. Um, so at that point, we built it out, uh, built out the software to house these symposiums. Um, so we moved, we realized that there's other companies that, ha that have needs and these solutions. And as we, when people saw, especially at this symposium, our work, they asked the question, who built it? Um, so naturally they sent it to just us um, Troy and Travis, and we, was, hey, we need to grow this into a real business. Um, so at that point, we've been launching and, and building software over the last 10 years. Um, we, we helped directly build over 250 software projects. Um, we've helped and consulted with um, around, I think right now we're at maybe 5,000 companies that we've done consulting with, um, and we have a goal to reach 10,000 companies where we at least consult and help them get from a, one point to another point. So the way we measure that is we look at, uh, we first determine the objective for that company and whether it's to grow your revenue to a million dollars, 10 million, 20 million. Um, and then we say, if you reach that, just contact us, send us a testimonial and let us know. Um, so the way we scale that is through tools and software. So we, we built training as well as tools in order to reach as many people as, as possible. Um, so we're quickly approaching um, that, that 10,000 mark uh, for, for our company. Yeah, so currently we have around 13 employees. Yeah, thir yeah. yeah 13 employees. Uh, some of them are uh, here locally. And then we have a couple that's overseas, that do overseas development. And to get to the name of the company is called Brand Range Solutions. So it's brain rain solutions, and it's primarily big, built upon two principles that you have the brainiac and you have the rainmaker. The brainiac is the person that's doing the execution behind the product, building the product, uh, making sure the product is high quality. But then you also have this rainy uh, rainmaker that brings the customer to the product. Because if the product is perfect, but there's nobody to see it, is it really a product <laughs> or you get the point? <laughs> uh, so the rainmaker really brings in the revenue. That's the salesperson. That's the, the marketing team. And then a the brainiac is the person who's executing. That's the, that's the technologist. That's the CTO. That's the programmer. Uh, and since we're identical twin brothers, it worked really well because I was really technical savvy and I could be able to you know, think of it and I can build it and really have a high technical prowess. And then you have my brother who you can see that he's good looking. Uh, you know, better than his twin. Uh, he's well spoken. He can go into a sales meeting and, and pitch the idea. So that's, that was the idea behind Brand Range Solutions. It just happened so that, that we are two Compl different people, compliments, yes, but yes. have a complimented, uh, get skill set to work together. You know, one of the things that the uh, College of Engineering, we think that we do really well, and it's a huge priority for us is to create, you know, the most diverse and inclusive environment that we could possibly um, imagine. And I'm really curious about your experience um, in that regard, you know, how you found Georgia Tech, and even, even after Georgia Tech, how you found the Atlanta startup community, um, for minority engineers, you know, in terms of investment, in terms of the, the whole, the whole picture. I know a lot of our listeners think will be really curious to, to get insight, um, on your experience in that regard. Yeah. So the Georgia Tech has a strong minority, um, culture that's at Georgia Tech. So we, we, we were blessed to be a part of the Black Graduate Student Association. ASU has a very strong presence at Georgia Tech. Um, and what I mean by strong presence is that what we don't have in numbers, we have in community. Um, so we may not be a majority from a, you know, ethnic background, culture background, but we have a very close knit 
um, community that everybody is willing to help each other out. Um, so our black, the Black Graduate Student Association is some of our best friends even to today. Right, yeah. uh, we meet regularly. We have a group meet chat from people that we met back 10 years ago at Georgia Tech. And they are our business, our friends, um, Troy's, the couple, three of Troy's grooms people were part of the Georgia Tech community when yeah. he got married. Um, so that's, that's a testament to how close knit that minority uh, presence is at Georgia Tech. Um, for us, we took that minority presence and then we brought it to tech and entrepreneurship um, after Georgia Tech and the startup community. Um, so what we're doing from a minority standpoint um, in the startup community is we're, try we're trying to build that same closeness that we had at Georgia Tech in that community with the closeness of the community, the, the, gr the greater black Atlanta tech community, that closeness um, with that community. Um, so we, we started a couple of initiatives. Um, the first one is, of course, the 10,000 Founders Initiative, where we are focused on helping 10,000 founders uh, with an emphasis, not necessarily, you don't have to be a minority, but um, we do, uh, you know, do target some minority business that come into, uh, come into our, uh, you know, marketing system. Um, and then also we started a space here in Atlanta. In Castleberry Hill, it's about right now 4,000 square feet. Um, uh, we've partnered up with, we're co-founders with other uh, other people. Four of them are Georgia Tech alumni. Four of them are Georgia Tech alum alumni. Two of them have PhDs. Yep. Um, so we took that closeness and we started to help out our minority, uh, you know, the minority community. Um, so we started this space and the whole purpose of space is to build, a showcase the, the quality of the work coming out of the minority tech and um, ecosystem. So um, that's some of the things that we've started. I um, mean, if you're interested, then just reach out to us. <laughs> Shameless, Shameless plug. plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we can uh, connect you with the right people, especially if you're a minority, because you need that, you need that backing. Um, you need that, you know, that uh, backbone, because um, it's different. People tend to, and I, I know I'm going on soapbox here, but there's a challenge that is not understood from a minority individual. Uh, people tend to invest, and this is just human nature, people tend to invest in people that look like them. Um, and sometimes you may have an opportunity, but don't understand why you didn't get that investment, why you didn't get that business partner. Um, and it's because you come from, sometimes, and it's not all the time, um, but sometimes you come from a different cultural background. Um, so that bias, we have to overset, offset with just getting support for those individuals that are not as privileged. They don't have inheritance. They come from low income. Um, they're, they're, they, they don't have the, we call it the rich uncle who can invest $25,000 um, into their startup idea or their, their, their new company. Um, so we want to be able to be that rich uncle for those, those people um, that I'm not saying I'm rich, but I'm just saying we want to be that support system <laughs> um, for those people so that we can um, help to help those individuals. Yeah, I think I think the space is going to be really big because right now it's COVID, uh, you know, in the COVID era. So it's not many people going into the space. But one of the things we did do was create a, a podcast room that allowed people to uh, go digital with their content. We also have a green screen room that allowed them to do video, videos and uh, go into social media. The space is really about innovation in the Atlanta community. So walk into a, uh, imagine going into a space, you see an AR VR lab off to the right, you see a motion capture, capture lab down the center, you see uh, pie cads, you see green screen rooms, you see uh, server racks for artificial intelligence, uh, you see an electronics lab for IoT development, so we're trying to centralize tech innovation, especially uh, in communities that are less privileged, to be able to have the resources like Georgia Tech-like resources at their disposal. And that's that's one of the things that we're trying to do in the in Atlanta community uh, right now. And Georgia Tech really, to be honest, Georgia Tech, we would not know what resources are available if we have not experienced going to Georgia Tech. Right, we want to know what, what equipment to buy and what is top level uh, 
type resources. So you talked about your experience, um, you know, in terms of in the minority community, how it is you're supporting, how the how the community, you know, has really come together. I think, you know, the statistics show that still vast majority of companies that are started are not started by minorities. There's so many other challenges um, around that. And I'm really curious about your perspective on how we can change both the narrative and the reality um, tied to that. Is it the investment community? Is it the education community? Is it uh, the city? Is it the culture? What are the things that we can really work on um, to change to change some of those? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. And uh, the, the number one thing is that you, got, you have to put your, yourself in the place of a minority um, person, right? Um, when, when we are starting our companies, uh, we're oftentimes, you know, feel like we're trapped. Um, so we're, we're going to a job and it's nine to five. We go there. We may or may not like it. Most of us are kind of like we don't love what we do, but we don't have a support system. A lot of time from minority institution, we're statistically, and this is not me that's saying this, um, you know, out of no, not, not factual evidence, but we're statistically um, don't have the wealth, at, uh, especially a black minority as other um, ethnic groups. Um, so we, we feel like we're trapped. Um, we're oftentimes have high debt um, and we feel like if we jump off and do our own thing, then we're gonna crash and burn. Um, so for us, knowing that, that those people who have this hit this pain in their stomach that they have to do something different with their lives and they don't want to be at a dead end job for the rest of their lives. Um, they have to have something to motivate them to get out of the trap. Um, so, so what we do is we started off putting around, putting content um, in place where we can help people motivate to take an action. And sometimes it's really simple for us. We were, we're engineers, but we read a book that changed our way of thinking that decided that we decided to take an entrepreneurship route back in, uh, I think that was 12th grade when we read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, so those type of information to educate our, our group, get them out of the trap so they know that they can do it and then put support around them by utilizing the, you know, our space, um, you know, putting together investment networks to help support those individuals to say, hey, you're not doing this by yourself. You may feel like you're trapped, but we're right here with rope to pull you out, to help you pull, to pull you out. Um, so for us, um, we feel like it first starts off with education and tools. My debt, the $100,000 I have in debt is going to cause me not to fulfill my dreams in life. Yeah, I think with the, with the minority startup community, first of all, five years ago, or when we first started 10, 10 years, over 10 years ago, it was very sparse. So you, it was hard to find resources in the minority startup community here in Atlanta. But I would say it has grown tremendously since. So right now, the Atlanta startup community is starting to be co coined the Atlanta Black Tech Mecca. Uh, because right now here in Atlanta, we have found a way to really unite and create an ecosystem around minority-owned businesses. So you have these uh, different groups that specialize in different things. Like Travis and us, we specialize in uh, tech education, making sure that you have the knowledge to be able to grow your company and potentially get funding. Then you have another group who specialize around funding, um, which is Collab Capital, which is Jewel Burks, who sold uh, her company. I actually worked with her in the past uh, with Park Pick, who sold her company to Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Barry, who, was, who sold his company. And then you also have these people who also start to create this ecosystem and create Slack and group me, uh, groups. Uh, you have technologies of color. And... So you have these different things of ecosystems that's coming together finally in the Atlanta area. And we think, and we all on the same page, even when I talk to every single one of them, and we all know that, hey, right now we're positioned in prime to really help and grow the uh, startup community. 
because now the people that these people that was doing startups seven years ago like us is now in positions like you know head of the startups with Google with Drew Burt or you have tech stars director that's Barry and you have Joy Womack who's over we work uh, so you have these people that that now can really propel the, uh, the the community. So one of the gaps, though, uh, I have to mention it, uh, is you, want, you so statistically you don't see a lot of uh, minority entrepreneurs have VC funding, and so you'll see these different uh, statistics. Hey, it's less than three percent for women of color. It's less than uh, probably less than 8% for minorities in general when, you know, our percentage, our population is 12, 13%. Uh, so it's, uh, just less. And the reason is for that is because when you, when you talk about funding, there's a pipeline. Um, you have to go through, you have to build your proof of concept. In order to build your proof of concept, you either can build it yourself if you have the knowledge. Um, but that typically requires a computer scientist or engineer. Uh, or you can go out and get the resources to do that. And that requires the family and friends to help donate to build out that proof of concept. Problem is, as Travis alluded to, well, African Americans are the lowest income out of all minorities. So we don't have that uncle who's willing to give us $5,000, $10,000 to build out a proof of concept. So we never even reached the VC stage when you have traction, because the VC stays only invest in companies, mostly invest in companies that have some type of traction and revenue. So that's the uh, one of the issues that a lot of people is trying to address is how do you get a entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur who may not have a tech background to move through that funding pipeline to grow their company? So um, I know both of you got your degrees at uh, at Georgia Tech, one in, uh, I think, Travis in mechanical engineering and Troy in uh, electrical engineering. And I'm really curious. And, and on the uh, Uncommon Engineer, we always ask how how people get involved in engineering and what what was it either your childhood or upbringing uh, kind of led you to engineering. Um, and I'm really curious uh, from both of you what uh, what that path was from from childhood to Georgia Tech. <laughs> well, we tell this story quite often. So, um, so our path for, to engineering started at a very young age. Um, so we were about 19 years old, and a friend of ours in our neighborhood, grandfather, built him a soapbox, um, which is like a derby car without an engine. Um, you roll it down a hill, and it was a very fancy soapbox. It had 18-inch wheels. It was painted with the best paint. Um, they drew a race car stripe down the middle of the yeah. um it had a steering wheel. So me and Troy saw this soapbox and we said, we have to have one. But our parents didn't have the money or expertise to build out this fancy soapbox. So we decided first, we have a problem here. We want a soapbox, how do we get it? Next, let's, do, let's build it ourselves and that's our solution. That's what we feel like engineering is all about the problem solution set. Um, so we went into the the woods, the forest where, you know, and, and found scrap metal. Uh, we, saw, we saw old uh, lawnmower that somebody left uh, and abandoned. We cut the lawnmower and got the wheels off the lawnmower. Uh, we took scrap wood and built the axle. We used a, a rope as our steering wheel. We had a stadium seat. We had a stadium seat, um, you know, back in our time, this may actually show my age, um, <laughs> but there used to be stadium seats where the parents would bring the stadium seats to football games and put it on a hard bench. Um, so we found a stadium seat to make our seat um, for, our, for our soapbox. And the pride, our soapbox was, was I don't know the best word, word for it, so I'm gonna say raggedy, <laughs> um, It was, um, but it was our soapbox, we made it. Um, and we made that and we were proud, we were proud to make that soapbox. And ever since that moment, that moment started our path to engineering. So we're born and raised Atlanta. And if you're born and raised Atlanta, um, then Georgia Tech is the only school you go to <laughs> for engineering. The only, there is no other option. Um, so our path has always led us to Georgia Tech. Um, so we decided that we wanted to get the best 
institute, um, for our graduate studies, wanted to get the best facilities and be around the most, uh, the best people who can push us and be the best that we can be. Um, so we decided that the best opportunity was Georgia Tech. Yeah, and one of the first experiences with uh, Georgia Tech was high school when we was part of a engineering club and Georgia Tech, some students from Georgia Tech came from Georgia Tech to the high school to help us build out a robot and eventually took us to uh, the Anaheim, California, where it was a conference where we had to uh, showcase this robot. It was a robot that is essentially car, uh, rode around uh, on a straight line. That's essentially what it was. But that was a, really the spark that believe that allowed us to believe that hey the Georgia Tech is the place for us and I remember years later uh, going into Georgia Tech and touring some of the labs in electrical engineering and one of the labs just everything just blew my mind with the resources that Georgia Tech had I remember going into the microelectronics lab and you see everybody with Hazmat suits and coats <laughs> and white coats. <laughs> oh, and, and, you know, because all the particles, you don't want the particles to get into the microelectronics. And that really was, was like, man, we got to come here. We got to come here. So eventually we applied and we started our uh, degree at Georgia Tech, our master's degree. And I took a class at Georgia Tech. It was a it was a network security class that was by John Copeland at the time, Dr. John Copeland. And one one of these exercises with the class was we had to essentially protect our computer and try to hack into somebody else's else's computer. So we had groups of teams, about four or five, who would sit in the room and we all just at the computer just going at it. And <laughs> that really sparked my interest in cybersecurity and seeing the the vulnerabilities that can happen in a in a computer, and from there I, I called, uh, went to Dr. Copeland's office, and I said, "Hey, we need. I, I can. How can I learn more about this?" And he said, "Hey, we got a under. We have a program that allows you to do studies, and essentially it was a graduate studies uh, course where you can go in and do a sample research project, and that propelled me. That experience propelled me to do my go further and do my PhD at Georgia Tech." And, and, you know, so many of our listeners are, uh, at least that I hear from, are high school students and even junior high school students. And I'm really curious about the kind of advice you would give to to students, particularly my, minority students, who don't necessarily uh, have the ability to follow the path that you did or even just know what the options are. What kind of advice would you give them? And And please shamelessly plug away. We love for as many students to connect to Georgia Tech as well as your space. I'm really curious about what um, what advice you would give to those students as they're thinking about science engineering um, for study. Uh, my advice would be would be to stay consistent. So always stay persistent and consistent about learning a particular crowd. So start around the problem. So. Like Travis mentioned, we started around the problem of, hey, we wanted to build a go-kart or a soapbox. And from there, that allowed us to start using skills and start learning skills that's related to building that. Uh, we also had a problem when uh, we was in college to have a place for resumes to be that was online. So we started doing a symposium. So start with the problem. Start with something that you have a passion for, and that kind of allow you to fuel your learning capabilities. Nowadays, before, uh, you really didn't have the online presence when, when we was growing up, where you can learn, you had to go into uh, different Library. physical libraries to, to learn information. Now there's a digital presence where the information is abundant and you can go to your Google, you can go to Udacity and look at some of the Georgia Tech courses as, uh, there uh, for essentially no cost and start learning early. And now that's my second piece of advice. Start learning right now. You today, right now is the time to learn how to how to do the engineering, how to do the problem solving, 
so that you can be able to advance in your career very, very quickly. Yeah, um, and mine's very similar. I, I think that you have to be passionate. Um, and I know that's cliche, <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, find something that you simply love and enjoy, um, but not only find that thing, but actually like, be a lifelong learner around that. Um, and it may look like engineering. Um, it may look like becoming a tech entrepreneur. You may want to be a developer or you may want to uh, start your own Tesla and build your own car. But I would say be passionate about it uh, first. Think big. So a lot of the students that uh, who are coming out of high school, they're just trying to get by. Uh, I asked I asked a student the other day, why do you want, he would say he want to be an engineer. I said, why do you want to be an engineer? He said, well, they make good money and it's, it's a, a, good, a job that I can have for 30 years. And I said, well, you might want to, engineering is a challenging job. I mean, we have high, high stress, high deadlines. Uh, we're working oftentimes 10, 12 hours and I don't want to discourage anybody from being an engineer at all. Um, but it's because, it's not because we have to do that. It's because a lot of times we love what we do. I mean, when I work um, hard at something, it's because that love transcends the hard work. It almost becomes like, and I tell Troy, the lifestyle we live as tech entrepreneurs and tech engineers is a lifestyle and not a career. Um, it, it, it permeates through my family. Yeah. I have my kid <laughs> uh, building science fair. Hey, man, let's go build a, a, a derby car just like I built one because I enjoy it so much. And that's on my on my Saturdays. Um, so it, you have to have a passion that can permeate and transcend of just being a career, but be something that you love doing. And all of us who've made some progress, some success in this space, even, you know, even, you know, the people who we look up to. They look at in, they look at their craft, we call it a craft, um, and they start to hone in, build, educate themselves and be the best around that craft, not because they have to, but because they love doing it. Um, and and that's, that's, what we, that's what I want to give to our, our younger generation, definitely. And, and even you our older the generation. Yeah, well, and one of the things that I, I feel incredibly, I can just see your energy and passion around what it is you do. And I feel the same in my job. And what I always say is I get paid to do something that I would do for free. Oh, yeah. right. um, exactly. Because I love what it is I do and I'm ready to pour all this time and energy um, into it. Well, one of the things that we always um, talk about here on the Uncommon Engineer is what makes you an Uncommon Engineer? So, Travis, Troy, really curious about um, what makes you an Uncommon Engineer? So for me, um, besides the, the, the obvious fact that we're identical <laughs> twins, black and tech, which is like rare, um, is my competitive nature. So being a twin, um, I am ultra competitive. Um, I, and it's innate because we were, we're athletes by, you know, um, we grew up as athletes and we're competitive, but I always had somebody I had to compete against. I'm always one to one up my brother. And it's not something that we're fighting over. It's a friendly competition. Sometimes he wins. Sometimes I'm winning. But now that competitive, competitiveness has made me a very uncommon, un, um, uncommon engineer. Um, so I always tell people if, if I was to go on a treadmill and we was going to see who's going to run, I'm out of shape now, but if we was going to see who's going to run the furthest, I'm going to win. And the reason why is because my competitive nature, I'm willing to die on the treadmill. And you're not. <laughs> um, so um, that's how, that's just, I know that seems kind of morbid, <laughs> but it's, it's just who I am. I am ultra competitive. So, of course, I win at everything, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think that competitive nature does allow you to excel. So, and that's also in Georgia Tech had a competitive uh, culture and having that when you go into the workforce, outside of Georgia Tech, that allows you to really uh, excel in the 
the companies that you work for or even the businesses that you own. Uh, one of the things for me that make me a uh, uncommon engineer is I can talk both languages, right? I can be an engineer, I can, I can code, uh, I can type really fast and I can build out any product you want, but at the same time, I can go into a business room and pitch a concept and get try to get funding. And I think that having that that work ethic and the knowledge on the technical, but also the ability to uh, communicate with each other and help grow each other and, and understand um, everybody's problems is a uncommon engineer for me. Well, Troy and Travis Nunnally, I can't tell you how uh, how thankful we are that you came today to join us here on the Uncommon Engineer. Uh, we are extraordinarily proud of everything that you've accomplished, uh, not only getting through Georgia Tech, but what you've been doing with Brain Rain Solutions uh, and the local community and how it is you're making a difference. They say, we, we are so proud of everything you're doing and really grateful for um, coming today. And all the very best. And for our listeners, check out uh, Brain Rain Solutions. Um, they're doing great stuff. Thanks for coming today, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Pleasure's all ours.